Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon, and then I post it back up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. I am proud to be sponsored by Better Help, B E T T E R H E L P, Better Help dot com slash Chris Godinas. Um, they are an online counseling service. So if you are in the UK, if you are in a rural area in the US and you don't like the, the counselors that are in your area, hi guys, um, you can get on to betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. John will put it down in the description. Fill out a few questions. They'll assign you a US counselor here or a counselor in your state. All the counselors are uh, licensed. They are either master's level or above. Um, Hi, Scotland. Wow, that's cool. Um, and uh, the cool thing is they're totally affordable. So like a package of four is like works out to like $65 a session, which is totally affordable. So that's totally cool. Anyway, thank you to BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Chris Godinas. That'll be down in the comments if you are looking to find a counselor in your area or if you're looking um, from another country to find a counselor here in the U.S. Okay, so today's topic is sleep issues, sleep disturbances. So first, let's do a little bit of review. So abusers love to torture us <laughs> in so many ways. But one of the ways they do that is with disturbing our sleep. So for example, uh, an abuser will do things like pick the worst possible time to start an argument, like right at bedtime, you know, right near bedtime. That's when they start arguments and then they'll just keep going and they don't stop. So, you know, the, the never, it's the never ending argument. That's what they do. It's like they start, you know, a few hours before bedtime and it just goes way into the day, you know, into the night and they just keep going and they don't let you sleep. So they argue, 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 and they don't stop. And so that interrupts our sleep schedule because we don't like arguing and we don't like upset. And we certainly don't want somebody who we love to be angry with us because that's just who we are. So we keep going, trying to get a solution. But what you'll notice is, is what abusers do is they start talking in circles, logic loops in, you know, the circular logic kind of thing. And they just word salad and all of this. And the argument goes forever and you don't end up getting any sleep. So that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is they intentionally um, make a point of interrupting your sleep. So let's say you're taking a nap because, you know, you're exhausted because they've kept you up all night screaming at you. So you've got like a break where you can take a nap. Well, they'll come into the room and start slamming doors, uh, slamming closets, opening and closing uh, uh, dressers or, you know, or out into the kitchen and slamming pots around, you know, that kind of thing. Because they can't stand it that you're getting a little bit of sleep. Is this on purpose? I believe it is. I believe it is because when somebody is sleep deprived, they're a lot more malleable to suggestions, which is why enemies with POWs would use sleep deprivation in order to get them compliant. So is it on purpose? You bet your sweet bippy. If you want my personal opinion, yes, they are doing this on purpose because come on, any healthy, normal person would know somebody sleeping. You're not supposed to be slamming doors and rattling pots and pans around and throwing open closets and shutting them loudly and think, you know, when somebody's sleeping, you tiptoe around, you shh, you know, that's what a kind person does, but <laughs> abusers are not kind. So, um, so yeah, so they create this sleep disturbance and pretty soon we start associating going to bed with arguing, or we start associating sleeping with being shocked awake. That was something that my parents did that I absolutely hated. And, and John knows this well, they would come in and they would throw open the, the, you know, they'd flip on the light you know, blinding light, you know, to wake us up in the morning. And I'm just like, no, no, wrong. Three things in this world I hate more than anything else, being shocked awake, cold toilet seats, and cold pools. Those are my three things that I hate more than anything else. So, so yeah, they would shock us awake, you know, throw open the blinds, throw, you know, instead of a, hey, good morning, wake up, you know, gentle kind of thing. And John has learned, God bless him. He has learned not to wake me up suddenly because I will be in fighting stance if I get shocked awake. I'm like, what's going on? You know, so that leads us into PTSD. So PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, right? 
CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is what we get when we have been abused over and over and over and over and over again. It's the complexness of it. It's the compounding of it. It's like compound interest, except it's compound abuse. So they do things over and over and over. And it's always something different, always something, you know, it's a different abuse every day, but it's still abuse. Does that make sense? So when we come out of either a parental abusive relationship or a romantic abusive relationship or a boss situation, coworker situation, abusive relationship, we will have CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, we've also got hypervigilance. And one of the other things we get is problems with sleep. So sleep disturbances. So all sorts of sleep issues because of the abuse that we were going through when we were with either the abusive family of origin or when we were with the abusive romantic partner or, you know, scared and worried about our job, our livelihood. Am I going to be able to survive? Am I going to make enough money? Is everything going to be okay? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, all right. So what do I mean by sleep disturbances? So common, common guys, this is all of these issues are common with survivors of abuse. So there's either going to be nightmares, like really intense nightmares, having to deal with the abuse itself or having to deal with processing why the abuser is not there, kind of like a drug dream, but it's still a nightmare because you're dreaming about the abuser or night terrors or sleep paralysis, which is scary. I've had that happen and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, or you, you have trouble going to sleep, like you're ready to go to sleep, you're exhausted, you want to go to sleep, but you get into the bedroom and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to sit here and count the tiles now because I'm not sleeping. Or we get to bed, we go to sleep, and then we wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning going, yeah, I'm wide awake now. What the heck? So this is all common with survivors of abuse. So I wanted to talk a lot about the different things that happen to us and why. So night terrors. Night terrors are very common in little kids. So a lot of times little kids will have night terrors. Is it necessarily associated with abuse? Could be, could not be. I mean, it could just be a developmental thing. I have seen it a lot in very small children that the parents were going through a very nasty divorce. So the kid, what happens with a night terror is the child will wake up but not be awake. So lights are on, engine is running, they'll sit straight up in bed and scream, just this horrific, terrified scream, okay? And adults do this too, guys. This is not just a kid thing. So this is a night terror. So a night terror is they sit straight up, they scream, but their eyes are vacant. It's like they're still dreaming, but they're not, they, they're not cognizant of their surrounding area or people around them. And it is impossible to comfort them. Like they're just inconsolable, just screaming, crying, inconsolable, night terror. Eventually, you know, the episodes can last up to a half an hour, which is terrifying for a parent. I had a niece that had night terrors and it just scared the living crap out of me. So, and you try to comfort them. They're inconsolable. Um, and it, they can last up to a half an hour. And then the child or the adult will go to sleep and wake up the next morning and have absolutely no memory of this whatsoever. So that is a scary thing to have happen as a parent. And this happens, like I said, I've seen it happen with kids that were going through a really particularly nasty divorce because there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of screaming. There's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of nastiness because the abuser never thinks of the child's well-being because kids are objects to them. They don't care. So um, so that's a night terror. So a night terror is when they sit up. They're not necessarily ambulatory. It's not like they're walking around or running away or anything like that. They just kind of sit straight up, screaming, crying, inconsolable, can't wake them up fully, can't get them to see, hey, you're safe, you're okay. All you can do is make them comfortable, remind them that they're okay, and hope that they go back to sleep. That's really mm, that's really the best you can do. So those are night terrors. They usually people usually outgrow them, but they can be triggered by extreme stress. Which hello, what are we generally under when we're getting out of an abusive relationship? Extreme stress. So yeah, it it can be re-triggered. We can have night terrors, nightmares. Are a little different. So nightmares are, we're not awake, we're asleep, but we're 
having usually dreams having to do with survival, you know, having to do with running away. You know, the, the most common one is we're running from something or something's out to get us and we've got to get away. We've got to get safe and we can't scream and we can't run. And oh my gosh, we're stuck. And this thing is coming at us and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a lot of times the nightmare is kind of a, Oh, the brain processing all of the trauma, all of the drama, all of the abuse, all of the, you know, everything. I mean, for years, I had horrible nightmares about my dad, just terrifying, you know, um, and weird, weird nightmares, very disturbing. You'd wake up and be like, yeah, I'm going to be calling my therapist today. You know, I mean, just <laughs> that kind of thing. So nightmares are a way of the brain processing all of the stuff going on in your waking life. If you're under a huge amount of stress, you're probably going to be having some nightmares because of the abuse. You know, if you're going through one of these horrific divorces, which where is that book that I always recommend? Bill Eddy and Randy Krieger splitting. You're going to need it because they're going to pull every nasty thing in the book. And in fact, next week, I want to talk about how to help the older teens that are having to deal with a narcissistic or abusive parent, how you can help them, especially with custody issues and things like that. And I'm talking like, you know, 16, 17 around in there because it's just ridiculous what abusers think they can get away with. And we're going to be talking about that next week. Um, anyway, so nightmares are common. So don't freak out if you're having night terrors or nightmares. It's a way of our subconscious processing through everything that we have been through. So with the night terrors, there's not a whole lot you can do to stop them, except maybe, you know, some some uh, post hypnotic, but not post hypnotic, but suggestions. So for example, when I do my evening going to sleep thing, so, okay, this is such a big topic. I'm sorry. I'm, my brain is kind of like, which way do I take it next? Um, okay. So we also have problems going to sleep. We also have problems waking up in the middle of the night. So what I like to do is I like to give myself a suggestion before I go to bed. So in the morning, you do the suggestion of, hi, good to see you. Have a great day. Okay, you've just told your subconscious you want a great day. I give you permission to say no or whatever it is you're working on the day. When you come home at night and you're ready to go to bed, give yourself a suggestion that you're going to sleep really well. That's what I do. So sometimes I do it in front of the mirror. Sometimes I do it as I'm laying down. But what I do is I go, wow, you know, here are three things I did right today. And you know what? I'm going to sleep really, really well. And nine times out of 10, I do. I usually don't have nightmares anymore. It's been a long time. Like I'll have one once a year, maybe, maybe if that. But um, I will give myself the suggestion, you know, I'm safe. Everything's good. Oh, this is so comfortable. I'm going to sleep so well. And then I go to sleep and I usually do sleep really well. But here's what you can do if you find yourself either waking up with a nightmare or you go to sleep, but then you wake up in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, and you're like, oh my God, I'm wide awake. What do I do? So here's what you can do with the nightmares. I think it's important to write them down. I really do. Because for two reasons, one, it lets you process it. What does this nightmare mean to you? What do these imageries mean to you? What, what is this about? What is your subconscious trying to tell you? That kind of thing. There is a dream dictionary on uh, the internet. Which is amazing. Some of them I agree with and some of it I'm just like, what were you smoking when you wrote this? But there is a dream dictionary. It's called dream moods. Sometimes they're right on. Other times I look at their symbology and I'm like, no, that's not what that meant. So you always want to go with what you think the symbology in the dream is. You don't want to rely on a dream dictionary. You want to really rely on you because those are personal. It's like it's personal to you. So, um, and yes, Jung has this whole, you know, archetype dream collective unconsciousness. Those tend to be pretty universal, which I'm going to talk about later when we talk about sleep paralysis. So, um, it's good to analyze the dream. It's good to write it down because then you can get it out of your head and onto paper. Why? Because then the amygdala goes, oh, she did something about it. Okay, I can let it go now. Whereas if you're in a dream and you just try to go back to sleep after this horrible nightmare where you're running or you're trying to get away from something and it's unresolved, then the amygdala is going to go, um, uh, you know what? We never got away. Um, you realize we never got away, right? You, you got that we never got away, right? You know, and it'll just keep you up. So you want to write it out. Write it out. Figure out what it means to you. You also want to self-soothe while you're doing that. I'm safe. I'm okay. 
Nobody's going to get me. Everything's fine. My abuser is nowhere near me. Everything's good. And you're going to breathe, 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 breathe. Because remember, when we wake up from a nightmare or a night terror, we are in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, full blown. I mean, like full blown, panting, crying, screaming, whatever. So you got to breathe. You got to breathe. You got to remind yourself to breathe because breathing is the key to calming down that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Because remember, the amygdala perceives a, a, a threat. Real, imagined, or a dream, it will respond the same way. Oh my God, here now, here now, here now. This is happening here and now. That's how the amygdala responds. That's why I keep saying the amygdala, God love it, is 3 oh stupid. Cannot tell the difference between a dream, reality, a real threat, a thought about a real threat, an emotional threat, a thought about an emotional threat, something that's happened in the past, something that's happening right now, or something that could happen in the future. It's all here now, here now, here now, here now. So the best way to short circuit this thing telling the hippocampus and the hypothalamus to release cortisol, which then causes us to tense up and causes us to stop breathing. We take puffy little breaths, which then in turn tells another part of the brain, oh my God, release the adrenaline. So all of this adrenaline gets released and we're shaking like a leaf, racing thoughts, racing thoughts, pounding heart, pounding heart when we wake up, right? So breathe, breathe, self-soothe. You're safe. You're okay. Journal it out. What was happening? What was happening in the dream? What did the symbology mean to you? Get the dream moods thing, compare it, see if that helps. Because sometimes when things are a little murky, the dream moods can help. And they're not always right on, but you know, it can point you in a good direction. So there is that. So, okay, breathing is the key. <sighs> So if you wake up or if you are having difficulty going to sleep in the first place, what you're, or if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh my God, I'm totally awake. All right. What you're going to do is you're going to tense and release muscles and you're going to start at your toes and you're going to take a deep breath and you're going to tense just the toes, not the feet, not anything else. And let it go. I'm safe. I'm okay. I get to sleep well. It's all right. Then you're going to move to your feet. You're going to tense the feet, not the toes, not any other muscle. Deep breath. I'm safe. I'm okay. You let that go. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. Then you move up to your calves. Just the calves, not the thighs, not the feet. Tense those up. Take a deep breath. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. Then you're going to move to your thighs. Tense them up. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. Release them. Now you're going to do your stomach, not anything else, just your stomach. Tense that up. Take a deep breath. Let it go. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. You can do your glutes. Tighten up the glutes. Let them go. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. And you do that all the way up. So eventually you'll get to your face and you tense that up. Oh, let it go. And you're going to breathe and you're going to go all the way back down doing the same thing very slowly. You don't do it as fast as I was doing here because I'm just showing you guys how to do it. So hopefully for me, when I have to do that, I am usually asleep by the time I get to my chest because it's like I finally have enough oxygen CO2 going so that the amygdala shuts the up. <laughs> it doesn't keep going. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So oxygen, getting oxygen into the body, self-soothing is the key. The tensing and releasing, basically what that's doing is you're, is you're kind of, you know, rubbing your belly and, and patting your head. And that keeps your brain from going a hundred thousand million miles an hour because it will otherwise. So it's like a dog with a bone. You know, if you give the dog something else to focus on, it'll drop the bone. And that's basically what you want. So that's why you're doing the self-soothing talk. That's why you're tensing and releasing the muscles and breathing. I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything. It's fine. Ooh, tensing and releasing. You know, you can even do whole body. Oh, I'm going to tense my whole body. Ah, I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. So it's really what it is, is getting the brain or the amygdala off of whatever topic it is trying to make you freak out about and giving it something else to do, which is the tensing and releasing, breathing, letting it go, self-soothing talk. I'm safe. 
I'm okay, everything's fine, you know, that kind of thing. So, okay, so that's what you can do. Now, if after you have gone all the way up, all the way down, and your brain is just like, yep, nope, not happening, we're awake, get up out of bed. Get up out of bed, go into a different room, make yourself some chamomile tea or something that will soothe you that does not have caffeine in it. Read, journal, do something, but really get out of the bedroom because our brains are so funny. Because of the abuse that we've gone through, um, we start associating the bedroom with either arguing or nastiness or nightmares or not sleeping or night terrors or whatever. You don't want to do that. So you don't want to just sit there and lay in bed and go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. Because now your brain's like, yep, you're right, can't sleep. Just going to stay awake and talk to you, you know. So you just want to, and it's going to start associating the bedroom with not sleeping. So that's why after 20 minutes, get up, go out into a different room, do something else. Do something else. Read, sip some chamomile tea, listen to calming music, you know, do some meditation, do some breathing meditation, things for you to help you go back to bed. Now, the other thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure that your bedroom is safe and comfortable. So for some people, if they had abusive parents, and we kind of talked about that last week, and the abusive parents would not allow privacy, right? Like they would take the door off the bedroom and you had no privacy. You couldn't have your own space. Having a locked door sometimes makes people feel very, very comfortable when they're sleeping. You know, I personally like to sleep with the door open, but that's because I have dogs. Well, dog. And, you know, I want them to be able to come and go and not, you know, have to beg to be let out, all that sort of stuff. But, um, but you know, it's whatever makes you comfortable. You want to make sure that your bedding is comfortable. You want to make sure that the, the temperature is comfortable. Sometimes what can help too is aromatherapy stuff. So smells that make you feel safe. Some people love lavender. You know, I, I like some lavenders and other lavenders. I'm like, that's not lavender. Why does it say it's lavender? Ooh, you know, so um, you find a smell that you like. So one comforting smell is vanilla, you know, reminds us of cookies. So that might be something to put in your bedroom to help give that safe, comfortable, you know, reassuring kind of smell. Like this is okay. I'm safe. This is good. I'm, I'm okay. Everything's fine. You know, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. So whew, there's other sleep issues. So I think, um, okay. All right. Do, 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 do. Um, basically it, the other thing you want to do too, is if you are having nightmares, you want to rule out anything physical, any physical ail ailments that might be going on, any new medication you might have started taking. That too can cause sleep disturbances. So make sure if you guys get onto any sort of medications, you talk with them, the doctor, about any sort of side effects that you need to be aware of. Because sometimes sleep issues are definitely caused by uh, pharmaceutical, psychological pharmaceutical drugs. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Try to see if there is a pattern to your nightmares or your night terrors. Is there a pattern? Is there, you know, like, is something happening on a consistent basis? Is the dream reoccurring? What is the pattern? Um, do they occur in the first half of the night? Do they occur in the second half of the night? That can tell you a lot about what your REM is doing, what your REM sleep is like. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Have you been recently ill? Do you have a fever? Um, you know, a lot of people that have had COVID have, ex have expressed that they've had ridiculously vivid nightmares, you know, um, when, especially when they're in the heart of the disease. Um, have you experienced a stressful incident? You know, is there something going on at work? Does somebody remind you of your mom or dad? That's another thing that can happen is that somebody in a position of power reminds the person of their original abuser and oh my gosh all of a sudden they're having all these nightmares well there that's why so you want to start looking for patterns does somebody remind you of your abuser i mean if you're uh, if you otherwise in your life is safe but you've got a boss that kind of reminds you of your abuser ooh that could be it or a coworker or whatever and that's something to think about um okay let's see all right so how to help regain sleep adhere to a routine and that's huge <clears throat> and this is something I talked about briefly a few months ago. 
Kids that have been in an abusive family tend to stay up late. We do because we want to avoid dealing with the abuser. I used to stay up until three o'clock in the morning. That was perfect because then I would sleep until about noon and I wouldn't have to deal with my dad. Well, of course, he had a fit about that. Well, how dare you? And you need to be up with the sunrise and blah, 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 because he needed a punching bag and I just wasn't available. So um, get a sleep routine and help yourself realize it's okay to not stay up all hours of the night. You don't need to avoid the abuser anymore. You know, you're out of the situation, you know, if you're out of the situation. Um, so adhere to a routine and a schedule every night and every morning. So it's really good to wake up and go to bed within a half an hour of, you know, your, whatever your schedule is. Because if you oversleep, that's going to cause problems. If you don't, you know, if you stay up really late and then get up early, you're going to be exhausted. So you want to try to find a good schedule where you can have a routine. It's routine. You get your circadian rhythm going again. And, you know, again, I swear to you, abusers do that on purpose. You know, have a fit with your sleeping routine. Don't want you to avoid them because they need a punching bag or they wake you up, you know, angry that you're not there to be screamed at, you know, whatever they're BS is that particular day. Um, okay, limit your caffeine and alcohol. So I have one cup of coffee in the morning and that is it. If I have any more than that, it's going to wreak havoc with my evening and I don't do it. So um, exercising can help. Waking with the sun can help. So what John and I have discovered, you know, over our years of being together is we really like the natural wake up thing. So there are a lot of alarm clocks that will do the gradual sunrise kind of thing and get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and then do like a, a nature noise to wake you up. So like birds or, you know, a waterfall or, you know, something like that. And I much prefer waking up to that than some freaking alarm that's going me, 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 which will guarantee me to wake up in a bad mood and be on high alert and ready to kill somebody. So yeah, so find a, um, a natural alarm clock, the ones that do the gentle light, you know, that usually we wake up when we see the light because it's kind of like, oh, it's morning. Okay. You know, and that helps us start our day. So and go walk with the pup and everything else. Um, avoid lying in bed while awake. So you really want to use your bed for sex and sleep. And that is about it. You don't want to be doing watching TV. You don't want to be, you know, just lying there reading or whatever. Do that in another room. I want your brain to start associating the bed with relaxing, not thinking, relaxing. So yeah, that's important. Um, sleep with a cooler temperature. All right, moving on to the next one. Oh my God, I'm running out of time. Sleep paralysis. Let's talk about that. Sleep paralysis is similar to night terrors in that you're awake sort of, but you're paralyzed. So your, your body is paralyzed so that you don't harm yourself while you're dreaming, obviously. But you're awake and, and you can probably move your head. That's what happened to me. I could move my head side to side, but I could not move the rest of my body. So this happened to me when I was in college. I was under a great deal of stress. It was during finals and I had a typewriter. This is going to show how old I am. I had a typewriter in the corner of the room and I woke up and I realized I couldn't move and I could turn my head, but I couldn't lift my head. I could turn my head either way. And I swear hand to heart, Swear to God, I heard the typewriter going. It was just click, 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 click. And I was convinced that when the paramedics finally found my dead body days later, that they would find a note on the on the typewriter. And it wasn't terrifying. I mean, that's the thing. Because usually when people have uh, sleep paralysis, they have the old hag. Um, and that's that's throughout a lot of different cultures. The old hag is where people are having nightmares or sleep paralysis. They wake up, but they're not fully awake. They're still kind of dreaming. It feels like there's somebody sitting on your chest, you're paralyzed, you can't move. And so our brains go, well, why is this happening? And so, you know, you see the old hag sitting on your chest kind of thing. I didn't do that. I mean, I did feel paralyzed. I did feel like, okay, I can't move. My thought was, this is just the way my brain works. I was like, well, crap, I've had a stroke. Damn it. They'll find me dead in a few days. Okay. <laughs> kind of accepted it and I went back to sleep and then I woke up and I was fine. So, but sleep paralysis is where the body is not awake, 
the brain might be awake, certain parts of the brain might be awake, but you're still kind of in that REM sleep and you may have hallucinations like I did, like I totally hallucinated that the typewriter was click clacking away. So yeah, that's sleep paralysis. And it's terrifying. It is. I mean, especially if you are having visual hallucinations, nightmares, while this is going on, that's not good. Um, so really with sleep paralysis, it's usually brought on by stress. Uh, there's usually a family history of it. Um, there's not much you can do to stop it except monitor your stress levels and, you know, reassure yourself if that ever does happen. It's like, oh, okay, this is sleep paralysis. I'm okay. Everything's fine. I will get to questions in just a minute. Hold on. Um, so another thing to check out, though, is some physical things. So you also want to eliminate sleep apnea. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night or you're waking up in the morning and you're just exhausted, like you slept a good amount of time, but you're still just like, oh my God, I just can't keep my eyes open. What the heck? Rule out sleep apnea. It might be time to have a sleep study done, honestly. Um, sleep apnea is when the soft tissues in the back of the throat just relax to the point where the oxygen can't get through, the airways are blocked. So that is something that you want to think about. Another thing that uh, survivors of abuse report is restless leg syndrome. So just that sense of twitching, itching, needing to move, can't stop moving, that kind of thing. Um, so there are medications for that. Again, I would prefer that people try things naturally first. Uh, sleepwalking and sleep talking, also very common with abuse survivors. Um, so that just, it's just our brain dealing with stuff and Sleepwalking can be dangerous. Um, I don't like ambient. So a lot of originally years ago when ambient first came out, everybody was like, oh, just give them ambient, blah, blah, blah. Well, a lot of my clients started reporting things like sleepwalking, sleep eating, sleep sex, sleep driving, you know, <laughs> waking up in the middle of a field, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm just like, oh, no, nope, 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 nope. Try natural things first. Breathing, meditation things like that. You want to use pharmacology as an absolute last resort. You don't want to start taking all these different chemicals into your body if you don't have to. I mean, if you have to, obviously you have to, but don't, don't go for a, a nuclear bomb when something less will do is what I'm trying to say. You know, it's like, you don't want to go for full blown, oh my God, throw everything at it when really you just need something less. So be aware of that. Narcolepsy. So a lot of, a couple of my clients have got narcolepsy. So it is um, when you are unable to stay awake, um, but it's, it, you could also have vivid hallucinations from this. Uh, it typically begins in childhood or young adulthood, although it is possible for it to onset later in life. Um, they do have medications for it. They are pretty heavy hitting um, so again, if you are having trouble staying awake or if you're having sleep apnea or if you're exhausted or anything like that, rule out all of the physical stuff first. So there is that. Um, okay. So let's just recap. So abusers love to interrupt our sleep. They love to create it so that we have no safe place, not even in our unconscious. So it's really important that you start associating sleeping in the bedroom as safe. And it's as comfortable as possible. If you are having any of those issues, you know, sleep paralysis, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, uh, night terrors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, start with the breathing, rule out physical. It could, if sleep apnea is happening, that's a physical issue. Um, so do the breathing, do the tensing and relaxing, make the room as comfortable as possible. If you wake up in the middle of the night or if after 20 minutes you cannot go back to sleep even after doing the breathing and all of that, get up, get out of bed, go journal, drink a hot cup of tea, something to soothe you. Um, but don't start associating the bedroom with not sleeping. That's that's where we start getting into problems when it's like, oh, great, I'm not going to sleep again. Be careful what you say to yourself because the subconscious listens. So if you keep telling yourself you're not going to sleep in the bedroom, guess what? You're not going to sleep in the bedroom. So, um, yes, this is all common with survivors of abuse. So you're not crazy. 
This does happen. Sleep disturbances happen with CPTSD. Nightmares happen. So do try the suggestion to yourself. Hey, I'm going to sleep great. This is going to be great. I had give myself permission to have a good night's sleep. It's okay. Do the breathing, tensing, and relaxing, that whole thing. All right. So let's dive into the questions. Dun, dun, dun. How common is it for abusers to destroy the target's health? Absolutely common. They want to stand. Let me let me just, for those of you in the back who have not heard me say this for the last, I don't know, 10 years, they want us dead. They want us dead. They absolutely want us dead because they hate us because we feel they don't. They don't love. They do not love. They cannot feel love. They don't feel love or experience love the way you and I feel or experience love. So their goal basically is to kill the target of abuse because it's a power trip for them. So let me give you an example. Target of abuse has got either pre-diabetes or diabetes. What does the abuser do? Shoves candy, shoves carbs, shoves alcohol, shoves, you know, whatever at the target of abuse because they basically want them dead. So yeah, they absolutely, they absolutely try to kill the target of abuse. It's, it's not... <laughs> It's either overt or it's covert. So the baseball player recently, I think you might have heard about it, the plays for the Braves, was just arrested for domestic violence, hitting his spouse with an arm that had a cast on it. Could have killed her. Yeah, that's absolutely. <laughs> they want their target of abuse dead because it's a power trip for them. Look what I did. Oh, it's, it's almost like mocking God, right? Oh, I can take life away. I'm powerful. That's their BS. You know, because a healthy, normal person does not, A, want to inflict pain on anybody, or B, want to kill anybody. But abusers do, because it's a power trip for them. It is a power trip for them. Absolutely. Very common. Very, very common. That's why abusive relationships are so damn dangerous. It is so damn dangerous, because the target of abuse, you know, fell for the love bombing. We all fell for the love bombing. They, you know, then drop the mask and we keep desperately trying to claw back to that love bombing and it's never going to happen. And the abuse just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And they keep upping the ante. What can I get away with now? What can I get away with now? Until finally it's murder. And that's, that's just what they do. So they don't get better. They don't change. They don't grow. They don't mm -mm. run. Do not walk to the nearest exit. As soon as you realize you're in an abusive relationship, come up with a safety plan, get the hell out. It will not end well if you don't. So there's that. Um, okay. Uh, I am so aware of the next X, bleh, sorry. I am so aware of the X narc. I now know what's coming next. Yes, they are pre predictable right now. It's the silent phase. How do I get the strength to completely never talk to them again? I always end up feeling sorry for them. You've got to stop feeling sorry for them. They're doing everything on purpose. Everything is with an agenda. There is no oops on accident with them. And I'm going to be talking about that in a few weeks. Um, I'm going to title that one accidentally on purpose. Um, so what you do is you write out every rotten thing that they've ever done to you. And how many times they've done the rotten things. How many cycles have you gone through of hoovering? And then the love bombing, and then the love bombing gets shorter and shorter and shorter each time, and the abuse gets bigger and bigger and bigger each time. Write out a list of what they have done to you. You're also going to write out a list of deal breakers. What are your deal breakers? Boundaries. Boundaries. If you were your own child, male or female, doesn't matter, would you be happy that they're putting up with abuse? Probably not. So write a list of deal breakers. What will you not put up with? No name calling, no lying, no cheating, no stealing, no rewriting history, no gaslighting, no disrespect, no not respecting the word no. Those are all deal breakers. Second one, somebody does that, peace out, we're done. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's how you do that. The other thing you want to do too is you want to get with a good trauma therapist. What are you trying to fix? What are you trying to fix? Because remember, our inner child looks outside and goes, oh, somebody that reminds me of mom or dad. <gasps> Look at that. If I can make them love me, I prove these guys wrong. Half of a doo-doo sandwich, half of a doo-doo sandwich, <laughs> total doo-doo sandwich. Start working on you. What attracted you to this person in the first place? What are you trying to fix within your family of origin? What's going on? Why is your self-esteem to the point where you think this is okay for you to be treated poorly? You don't deserve to be treated poorly. You absolutely do not. 
So get the self-esteem workbook, Glenn Schiraldi, work it. It's an awesome book. If that is too regimented for you, get You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. That's another good book. Um, get CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Start working on the abuse that this person put you through. They don't deserve your sympathy, sweetheart. They deserve your silence. Absolutely. You don't deserve that. You don't deserve to be treated poorly by them. The silent treatment is used to control. It's the cold shoulder. It's the, oh, I'm not speaking to you and I'm going to harm you by not speaking to you. Because why? Because in our brain centers, we respond to the silent treatment the same way we respond to physical pain. It lights up the exact same area of the brain. They're doing it on purpose. Listen to me now. Believe me later. They're doing it on purpose. And if this has been a cycle, you always end up feeling sorry for them. You always end up going back. That's what they're counting on. Don't go back. Don't go back. Write it down. What did they do to you? Then start working on what in the heck is making you think that that's okay for them to do that to you. You're worth more. You're worth more. So start working on self-esteem. The self-esteem workbook, Lynn Sheraldi. You are a badass, Jen Sincero. Boundaries with... Uh, the Disease to Please, Harriet Breaker. Start working on the abuse, CPTSD, From Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. And don't just buy the books and go, okay, I bought them, and then not read them or work them. That's the other thing that really <laughs> annoys me is that people are like, well, it's not working. Are you doing the work? Well, no, I just read it. Okay, you read the book, and then you take what you've learned and you put it into action. Action is what's going to get you from point A to point Z. So you want to read the books, put it into action, make it a part of your daily life. Absolutely. Okay. Don't feel sorry for them. They do it on purpose. The other book you can read to really understand why and how and what is The Object of My Affection is In My Reflection, Coping with a Narcissist by Roquel Lerner. That's a phenomenal book. These people do not change. And they, what they will do with every Hoover is, oh, baby, baby, I've changed. Oh, baby, baby, it's different. Oh, baby, baby, it's going to get better. Oh, baby, baby, no, 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 They don't change. Leopard does not change its spots. Absolutely. They do not get better. They do not change. They don't want to. They do not want to. So um, stop feeling sorry for them. Get angry. You have a right to be angry. This person has harmed you. Get in touch with your anger, righteous anger. You don't deserve to be treated poorly. You are a child of this universe. You do not deserve to be treated poorly, ever, by anyone. Not by you, not by them. There you go. All right. Um, I used to be able to recall my dreams, and they weren't scary, but after stress from a narcissistic mother in my adulthood, I stopped remembering them and sleep very badly. Is this caused by the abuse? It can be. Absolutely, freaking lutely it can be. Yeah, you betcha. So um, when we are healing from narcissistic abuse, it, it, it messes with everything. Like seriously, messes with everything. We will not remember dreams. We will only remember the nightmares. We will, you know, have sleep disturbances, sleep poorly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and this is mostly related back to CPTSD. And that's why it's important to start working on you, giving yourself permission to sleep well, doing the breathing, doing the meditation, maybe some yoga, you know, gentle stretch yoga, not the, oh my gosh, turn yourself into a pretzel yoga before bed, before bread, <laughs> hello, <laughs> before bed. Um, so <laughs> I must be hungry. So um, yeah, you want to, you want to take care of you. And yes, it is a part of healing and you just give yourself permission to remember your dreams. That's something else that I do sometimes is I'll say, oh, you know what? I give myself permission to remember happy dreams. And I usually do. So again, it's the suggestion. It's the suggestion. It's the suggestion. So yes, this is a part of the abuse. Is it common for certain parts of the body to associate PTSD and trauma? For example, my shoulder hurts like heck when I'm arguing with a certain person. Yes, the body keeps score by Bessel van der Kolk. Wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Get it and read it. You're not crazy. You're not crazy. Plus the fact, think about it. We do armor. So when we're having to deal with abuse, we tend to armor up, meaning our muscles are super tight, like really, really tight. Like when I first went to get massages, my massage therapist, Diane and Devana, I have two of them. Um, they would start working. I mean, they're like, oh my God, you are Absolutely. I'm having a really hard time loosening these muscles. Like, well, because I was armored. 
I was completely armored, you know, this was years ago. So, um, anyway, Devon is actually retiring. I'm like, you can't quit. Um, so, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we armor up. We are, our body is trying to stay safe. And so it's, you know, it's getting us ready to fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And part of that is tensing up. And so we're tense all the time and the poor muscles are contracted all the time. So yeah, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Wonderful book, great guy, love him. He does a whole bunch of lectures. I, I don't know if they're for the public or not, but you know, I see him all the time doing lectures on this and he's great and I love him and that's a great book. So yeah, get that and read that. What about sleep paralysis? How serious is it? it? Happens at least twice a week. I have a history of childhood verbal and mental abuse. It's not, well, it's not serious in that it won't generally kill you, but it is serious in that if you are having those waking nightmares and you're paralyzed and you're seeing the old hag or you're having hallucinations, <laughs> mine was just a typewriter. That one was okay. But you know, if you're having serious hallucinations, like, you know, auditory, visual, etc., then what you're probably going to want to do is get with a good trauma therapist, EMDR, uh, EFT, CBT, or DBT, any of those modalities, but with a good trauma therapist, and start working through the verbal and mental abuse. Absolutely. Start working on your safety. Start working on, I'm safe. I'm okay. Everything's fine. These people have no more power over me. They, they have no power here. They have no power here. But do get with a good trauma therapist and start working on that. Get the books that I recommend. Start working through that. Take your power back. Take your power back. Um, and with sleep paralysis, it's usually stress-related. But, you know, if it keeps going even after therapy and things like that, then get a sleep study done. Let's see what's going on. There might be something else going on. Um, okay. Uh, what exactly is going on in the brain of a cleanliness freak when they're in the midst of an obsessive cleaning session? What purpose does this cleaning serve? Well, it's a metaphor. <laughs> it really is. It's about being in control. It's about feeling in control. And if their life is out of control in other ways, the way they can feel in control is to clean fanatically because they can control that. They can make the mess go away here. They may not be able to make the mess go away over here, but they're able to make the mess go away here. So it's a it's a comfort thing. It's a it's a maladaptive way of staying safe. It's a maladaptive way of getting their power back. So they can control this. They can't control that, but they can control this. So that's that's what's happening. Mm. And this is very common. This is this is very common with people who have been abused is to have a little bit of OCD with cleaning because it makes them feel safe. It makes them feel in control. You know, they can control this. They may not have been able to control that, but they can control this. And it is obsessive and um, it's a way of staying safe. So I would strongly suggest there's an OCD workbook that would be really helpful. Um, therapy, trauma therapy would probably be a really good thing for them to help them. Um, and finding a different way to cope with the stress. So if it's not hindering them or if it's not a problem, that's okay. But if it's interfering in the relationship, if it's causing them distress to be like, no, no, I have to get this done and I have to clean this and I have, okay, stop. We need to do some other better adapted way of dealing with stress. So get with a good trauma therapist to help them work on or get them with a good trauma therapist to help them work on stress and how to respond when they're feeling out of control. Absolutely. Uh, can someone love bomb without trying to be mean in tension? Like they've suffered a lot, are not very conscious, and they're not aware of their trauma. So... Okay, let me, I just want to make sure I understand this. Okay, so can someone love bomb without trying to be mean? So in other words, not being an abuser. Like they've suffered a lot, are not very conscious, and are not aware of their trauma, what to do. Okay, so if I'm reading your question right, and I may or may not be, so let me know if I'm, I'm completely off track. When somebody is not conscious and they've got trauma, that's usually an indication of borderline personality disorder. So borderline personality disorder is this fear of abandonment, very clingy, 
needing love and approval because of trauma that has happened in their childhood. So they do also tend to love bomb, not with the intent like the narcissists have of, you know, sucking them into their realm and then abusing the crap out of them. Unless, of course, they are further down on the borderline, you know, uh, stream here. What the heck am I calling this? It's, you know, less to more. My brain's gone. Um, so when they're further down on the line here and they get up into the, the queen and the witch, it's intentional just like with the narcissist. But when it's down here, it's generally just a plea to be loved. It's like, love me, love me, love me, love me, you know, and yet they're not willing to work on why they are clingy, why their attachment uh, style is, is dysfunctional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can do is you could, you know, hey, self-esteem workbook would be a really good idea. Um, I noticed this, the thing that you do and it's not healthy, maybe therapy would help you, you know, but don't expect them to react well, especially if they're not conscious of it. So, um, you know, you can lead a horse to water, <laughs> but you can't make him cha-cha, name of my book. But, um, and it's true because it's like, you can give suggestions to people and go, hey, this would be a really good idea for you to do. And they may or may not take it. You know, it's not up to you to force them to be healthy. It's you, all you can do. I have no answers, only suggestions. That's <laughs> that's really what a therapist does. It's like, look, I can give you suggestions, but you've got to do the work. So here's some things that I think might help you get what you want, really, which is to be loved, you know, healthfully. So look into it, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Uh, can you recommend a book that is more practical and less theoretical on how to put into practice new behavior in real life examples to avoid abusers. Books like CPTSD are mostly theoretical. No, they're not. They are actually based on the author's experience and the experience that he has seen with his clients. Um, so what you want to do is if you can't, if you can't hang with CPTSD, you start writing out a list of things that you do not want in your life. So what's your list of deal breakers? What do you not want to put up with? What is going on? And why are you wanting people that remind you of your family of origin in your life? What, what the heck's going on? What's going on? So if you want to work on the inner child workbook by Catherine Taylor, that's a great one too, because it forces us to deal with, childhood stuff. Um, you could work on uh, Codependent No More, Beyond Codependent No More, both by Melanie Beattie. There's a uh, codependent book uh, by PM Melody. Um, there is other self-esteem workbooks. You know, it really is a matter of, do you love yourself enough to stop allowing abusers into your life? Have you worked on self-esteem? Have you worked on boundaries? Are you willing to confront what it is that happened in your early childhood that is driving this need to try to fix this with that. So that's what you want to do. Absolutely. And then it's like, you've got to be your own police officer. Basically it's like, okay, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Why, why is ooh, this person reminds me of why am I doing that? Why am I allowing this person in my life? Why am I putting up with abuse? Why am I putting up with disrespect? What the heck? No is your friend. You get to say no. You get to say no. You get to not have abusers in your life. It's a matter of making the decision. I no longer want this, but I do want this. You know, so here's my list of deal breakers. Here's what I do want, you know, and then you start having to be your own cop, if you will, and the discipline to be, okay, this feels familiar. Wait a minute. Is this familiar in a good way or is this familiar in a bad way? And what am I going to do? So personal responsibility, huge. Okay, um, why do abusers pl play the victim? Okay, so when you have got the hermit in borderline personality disorder, or you've got the covert in narcissistic personality disorder, they play the victim. What is their end game? What are they getting out of it? What are they getting out of it? That's what you always wanna look at. Behavior says everything. So if they are playing the victim, what are they getting? Sympathy. They're getting attention. 
It's drama. They're getting attention. It's like, you know, oh, you know, I, I do all this for you and you never do this for me and poor me and da 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 da. And all the flying monkeys come out of the woodwork and they, oh, you poor thing and da da da. And, you know, giving them, you know, attention. So it's really, it's an attention thing because healthy, normal people don't like being the victim. They absolutely do not. Um, so, but they do. And the covert and the uh, hermit live to be the martyr. You know, I do all this for you and you don't ever write, you don't ever call, blah, 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 you know, that whole thing. So they are getting something out of it. They are getting, what's their, what's their payoff? Attention. They're getting attention. They're getting sympathy. And that's what they live for. And that's why they do it. Absolutely. Um, can a narc be a borderline as well? Yes. Absolutely. You can be both. I am, the more I have understood about personality disorders, I'm convinced my dad was both. I, absolutely. At first I thought it was just the narcissism expressing through the borderline, but now I think he was both. I do. I really, honest to God, think he was both. So yeah, a narc can be a borderline. Absolutely. Um, my elderly narc mom is extremely clingy and needy. Yeah, absolutely. And fear of abandonment and the whole thing. Yeah, they can be both. It can be, diagnoses can be dual. You can have dual diagnoses. You can be, uh, uh, mm, you can be narcissistic and depressive disorder. You can be narcissistic and bipolar. You can be narcissistic and name any other, you know, diagnosis. So yeah, absolutely. How common is maladaptive or excessive daydreaming? Very common. Very common in survivors of abuse. Absolutely. Um, can you reduce or stop it? I have difficulty feeling my emotions. Yes. So this, you can, but it would be easier with the help of a trauma therapist. It really would, guys. I mean, a lot of this stuff we can do on our own, but it really does help to have a trauma therapist kind of ask the right questions because we're not always going to be able to ask ourselves the right question. That's why I keep saying good therapists have therapists you know, to make sure that we're on the straight and narrow. So um, good therapists have therapists and it's good to have a therapist when you're working through all of this trauma to be like, okay, I didn't think about that. Ooh, what about this? Wow. Okay. You're right. Let's, let's explore this. Let's look at this. I haven't seen this part yet. So yeah, it's a really good idea to get with a good trauma therapist. And it's very common with survivors of abuse to have difficulty feeling our emotions. Why? Because our abuser did not allow us to have emotions. We could not have an emotion they didn't like. So if they didn't like tears, guess what they would do? I'll give you something to cry about and then they'd hit you, you know, or if you were angry at them, you, how dare you be angry at me? I'm the adult. You can't be angry at me, blah, blah, blah. And then they hit you. At least that was my experience. Um, you know, <coughs> excuse me. So yeah, it, you know, if you were happy and they don't feel happiness, they would get jealous. They would get angry and they would ruin it on purpose. That's why they destroy it. Weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, special occasions, etc. Because it's not about them and they can't feel it. They cannot feel it. So they're jealous and they're angry and they can't stand the fact that you're having an emotion that they cannot feel. So they'll ruin it for you. Absolutely. Um, so th this is common that we have a difficult time with our emotions. So one thing to do would be to get an emotion chart. Track your emotions throughout the day. Practice emotions throughout the day. Allow yourself to have emotions. So for example, um, when a client comes to me and they're grieving and they've been abused, the first thing they'll say when they start crying is, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't be crying. Whoa, 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 you're grieving. You absolutely should be crying. It is okay to cry. In fact, let's cry together. You know, it's okay. You know, and they'll tell me their story and I'll start tearing up and then they start crying because I've given them permission to cry and it's safe. And they see that I'm, you know, having the similar experience. I can relate to death. I can relate to an animal dying. I can relate to a beloved family member dying or friend, you know, and it gives them the permission to do that. So give yourself permission to feel emotions are good. Emotions are good. Anger is even a good emotion. Why? Because that lets us know where we've been hurt. It's telling us, hey, you've been hurt here. That's why you're angry, because somebody hurt you. It's okay. It's just not okay to take it out on anybody. You don't want to ever take an emotion out on anybody, but you do want to be able to feel it, because it's there. It's a warning. It's a warning. It's a warning system. It's like, whoop, you've been hurt. Okay. You're angry. Okay. Now what? You know, work it through.
It's like, okay, where did I get hurt? Who hurt me? How did I, how did this happen? What can I do? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the emotions are good, but abusers don't like emotions. They don't because they can't feel them. Really, they really truly do not love. They the anger they've got down great because they use it as an excuse to abuse, but they don't love. They don't feel sad. They don't you know because honestly, think about it. How many times have we heard? from a target of abuse, you know, I just don't get it. Why, how could they not miss me? How could they not miss this beautiful relationship that we had? How could they, because they don't feel. They don't feel. They don't have that sense of, wow, I really miss the love that was there because they don't recognize it. They do not recognize. They don't miss us when they're gone. They don't sit there and go, gee, I really screwed up. They'll tell you that, but they don't really feel it. They don't really feel it. They don't feel. So it's our mission to relearn how to feel, how to have emotions, how to be okay with it, how to be safe with it. And part of that is giving yourself permission to have emotions and it's okay. You're safe. You're okay. Everything's fine. It's all right to cry. It's okay to be angry. It's just not okay to take it out on other people, but it's okay to be angry. It's okay to express anger. Hey, I'm really angry. This hurt. That's okay. You know, Yelling and screaming and calling him names, not okay. But, you know, expressing, I'm hurt, this hurts, I'm angry, that's okay. So it's get back in touch with that. Get with a good trauma therapist. I really strongly suggest that because the daydreaming is a maladaptive way. It's a way of escaping, you know. And when I was a kid, I did that all the time. I did. I would just, in my head, daydream, you know, peace out, not dealing with the crazy family, you know, that whole thing. But do get with a good trauma therapist and it will lessen as you work on yourself and as you get confidence in yourself. You have the right to have emotions. You have the right to be a loving human being. You have the right to exist. You have the right to like yourself. Absolutely. So work on all of that. Get with a good trauma therapist. Absolutely. Can you heal while you are still in contact with your abuser? Oy, no. Yes, but no. So you can do a certain amount of healing, but every it's going to be like salmon going upstream. Seriously. So it's like any progress you make, they're going to be undoing it as quickly as you show change because they don't want you to change. They don't want you to get better. They don't want you to be different. They don't want you to leave. They don't want to lose their favorite punching bag, either verbal punching bag or physical punching bag. So, um, yeah, it, it's really difficult. I mean, yeah, you can do some healing while you are still in contact with them. I would not recommend being in contact with them. It would be better if you went no contact. But yeah, you can do some. Now, something that I've seen abusers do is as soon as they find out that the target of abuse is either in therapy or working these books that I've recommended, they will demand that they stop therapy, which is the usual case. Or they will find the books and oops, threw them away. You know, that's what they do because they don't want the target of abuse to get better. So if you are still in an abusive relationship, put them someplace, put the books someplace where they can't find them. Or if you have them on your phone, have it locked so they can't get into it. You know, the Kindle stuff, I don't, I don't, I like real books because I just, I like the smell of them. I'm weird. Um, so yeah, so have it so that they cannot get to those books. So yeah, they will absolutely try to stop you from healing. Absolutely. I mean, you could do a little bit of healing, but it, you're not going to be able to fully heal until you go complete no contact with them because they'll undo it. They'll undo it. All right, kids, that is it for today. So next week, I want to talk about ch older children in divorce. So 16, 17 years old, dealing with a crazy narcissistic parent custody battle. What the heck can you do to help them? What can they do to help themselves when they're in the middle of this and having to maybe possibly go before a judge and say, hey, I don't want to be around this other parent because that's a terrifying thing for kids to do. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about self-esteem workbooks for kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You guys have a great week and I will find my cursor. Where did it go? Have a great week and I will talk to you later. Bye.